Thank you very much, Mike. Thanks to everyone who's come back for another week. And anyone who's new this week, welcome. Uh, last week, we did kind of uh, focus on Bill Monroe, the, the acknowledged father of bluegrass. We looked uh, at the course of his career from early influences, personal influences, through uh, the height of his uh, career as a member of the Grand Old Opry and uh, a national, national presence. This week, we're going to roll the, the calendar back. And uh, one thing you learned about bluegrass last week is tempo. And a nice, brisk tempo is, is a signature characteristic. Well, that's going to be a characteristic of today's lecture. We have about 100 years to get through in about 45 minutes. So watch me work. <laughs> Uh, so, when we learn uh, American history, we usually learn about the, uh, the Virginia planters, the, the early uh, tobacco plantations and, and economic interests in Virginia. We learn about the pilgrims up in the Northeast. Uh, but uh, we tend not to learn as much about uh, sort of the, uh, the waves that came afterwards, many of which uh, were simply, uh, you know, working class folks, farmers, uh, indentured servants in some cases. And uh, for, the, for our story, there's a very important immigrant group uh, known as the Scotch-Irish, Scots-Irish. And uh, they were displaced folks from both Scotland and England and Ireland. And eventually, they found their ways to these shores in the early 17th century. And even there, they kind of uh, were displaced to the western reaches of the early colonial period, which is to say the Appalachian Mountains, the real wilderness of the day. And a place where they were kind of unobtrusive, left, uh, left to their own devices, and where interestingly, a lot of uh, English folkways and Irish folkways were preserved. Uh, the earliest uh, ethnomusicologists in the Americas were, often went up into those mountains looking for old English ballads which they found. In, uh, you may, if you've uh, learned a little bit about the history of the English language, you may know that there are isolated pockets, uh, islands off the eastern seaboard, and other such pockets where the accents and vocabulary are almost like Elizabethan English. Well, similarly, uh, musical song, literally songs, but also musical styles and sensibilities were preserved uh, in the Scots-Irish communities of the Appalachian Mountains. And, uh, and that's part of where our story, uh, the roots of bluegrass and country music begin. Basically, in this rural setting, uh, you had a couple, two kinds of music that people generally encountered and uh, enjoyed. And one was what we might call social music, music people made for themselves and for their own entertainment. Uh, someone might have a fiddle. Uh, if they were uh, especially well healed, they might have a guitar. Uh, you see the woman in the left-hand picture here. Let me see, I have a pointer. She's got a little auto harp in her lap. It's sort of uh, strummed a little like a zither, and it has some push buttons for chords. And uh, people on a Sunday afternoon might play at the picnic, or they uh, might play for a dance on Friday night. Basically, the only entertainment you had was that which you made yourself. Probably had one book in the house. Uh, which would be the Bible, and you might have a, a rifle of some sort, and, uh, and if you're lucky, also an instrument. And the person who, uh, who played music and could provide music on in the evening was well thought of. Uh, the Pete Seeger tells a story about a, an old gentleman who said he, want, he decided to learn violin, learn to play fiddle, because he noticed that the fiddler always got the spot right near the fireplace on a cold <laughs> evening. So here we're going to hear a little bit of... Uh, kind of very early uh, recorded social music and just it give you a sense of, of what it would, what it sounds like <laughs> pretty jaunty tune, actually. I might like to get up and dance for that. Uh, you might have noticed the intonation 
and the, even the tonality sound, maybe sounded a little dissonant to you, especially in the, in the latter half of that excerpt. Um, again, this, this was uh, a little local flavor. Each, each uh, holler, each little valley would, might have their own unique style. There'd be the local musician, and the people didn't necessarily travel from one town to the next all that much. The connections were not especially good. Of course, there was one other place people would go and hear music, and that would have been uh, at church. And they would have gotten together on Sunday morning, and uh, singing was usually a large part of that. Uh, there was a tradition, or actually it was an innovation of sorts, uh, that was introduced in, the, in rural America, which is called shape note singing. And it was a way of teaching music that you didn't have to learn the formal notation, but rather worked, each note had its own shape. I'm, I am not an expert. I would love to talk with anyone who is, uh, if there's one in the audience. But I understand it was a simplified version, kind of, you didn't have to be especially literate to get the gist of it. It could be taught to a community, probably within a weekend or a week. And so there were a lot of hymnals that would have been written out in shape note singing. And the harmonies that you find in these shape note hymnals are very distinctive and also uh, are the sound of this time and place. So let's give this a listen. This is uh, not necessarily a pre-industrial age, but this is, prob this is a effectively pre-industrial region. Um, they were, would have been farmers and kind of uh, a you know, general store, perhaps, but uh, really uh, pretty self-sufficient and uh, isolated communities, uh, even uh, uh, as we got into the end of the 19th and early 20th century. But gradually, you do have uh, railroads coming through, there's uh, mining to be done, coal to be extracted, uh, and other sorts of trade to be developed. Of course, uh, we get across the Appalachians. So with, uh, with the railroads come all sorts of technologies. And for our purposes, one of the most important is that of recorded music. Um, our good friend Thomas Edison uh, develops early forms of uh, electric sound reproduction. And by the 20s, the early 20s, you have a number of uh, great, look at those beautiful labels, look at those beautiful record labels. Uh, you have recording companies, often attached to furniture companies, because it's the furniture companies who build the gigantic Victrolas, as they might have been called if you're playing a Victor record. You can see the little dog hearing his master's voice, right? HMV comes from his master's voice. Uh, and so really it was, uh, you know, there was no recording industry to speak of. It was sort of a way to move furniture and move recording equipment, this great new product. Okay, now, but it didn't take long for people to realize that there was money in music as well. Uh, and one of the earliest breakout hits of the Southeast was a fellow named Fiddlin' John Carson. Uh, he was recorded in 1923, and uh, he it was basically an Atlanta furniture businessman who said, you know what, I think uh, we could sell some of these uh, recordings by this guy. He goes up to New York and he talks to a man named Ralph Peer, a name that we'll encounter again, and says, uh, let, me, let me record this guy. He, won a, he made a big splash at the Georgia Fiddler, Old Time Fiddlers Convention, and uh, I think they would do, do us some good. Well, Pierre says, after he hears the recording, that the guy's voice was plu perfect awful, he says. He really didn't care for it. But he said, go ahead, print 500 records, and do what you will. Well, within a month, Fiddlin' John Carson took his records to the next Georgia Old Time Fiddlers Convention in July of 1923, about a month after it was recorded. He immediately sold out of all 500. I'm getting old and feeble, and I cannot work no more. I love this 
might appreciate there. For one thing, it's important to realize that when people heard these recordings, they were gobsmacked how realistic they sounded. The, the, the fidelity of these recordings really uh, was stunning. Now, to our ears, we can hear how primitive the recording technology is. Um, but it was just such, uh, it was just about as shocking as the electric light bulb was. The idea that you could have light without heat and flame and that, that fire danger. The idea that you could have music without a musician was, uh, in, in the vicinity and from hundreds of miles away was just stunning. But it was a, a primitive technology, but it sold well. And uh, so while some were mining for coal, others were mining for talent. And you start seeing handbills like this all over the southeast. Johnson City Staff News, Johnson City, Tennessee, if anyone's interested in signing up afterwards, please let me know. <laughs> so that's how you, you start combing the hills. You start uh, sending out flyers. And uh, I can't remember if it's on this one. But uh, you know, the recording sessions then, would be people, they would just have blind people up, come through, come through, one after another. And if they heard something that they thought was promising, they'd run with it. Again, these sessions were often at the local furniture company. Uh, one of the breakout hits and breakout acts was a group called Gid Tanner and his Skillet Lickers, one of the great names. They recorded on uh, Columbia Records in the early 20s, also out of Atlanta, like Fiddle and John Carson. So the, Atlanta was sort of the hub, even uh, uh, before Nashville, was a great hub for uh, what some at that point called hillbilly music. And partly what they had discovered was a niche audience, that there was an audience in the hills of the southeast that was enjoyed hearing music that was of its own creation. So uh, these, I'm going to play you an excerpt in a moment of Soldier's Joy, which uh, you may remember Ambrose gave us a couple demonstrations of as well last week. Uh, so here it is. Well, folks, here we are again, the skillet lickers, red hot and ran to go. We're going to play you another little tune this morning. I want you to grab that gal and shake her foot and moan. Don't you let them dance on your new carpet, you make them roll it up. It's almost like uh, they captured a live performance. It wasn't. It would have been in a, in a studio such as it was, but uh, clearly you know, he had gotten, he had his energy up. And uh, interestingly, these folks only recorded for about 10 years, but uh, the number of recordings they made that have become, again, sort of a canon of uh, bluegrass music and uh, old time music in general, they recorded Alabama Jubilee, Shorten and Bread, Old Joe Clark, Casey Jones, John Henry, Bully of the Town, Boil Them Cabbage Down, the first uh, fiddle tune my daughter has ever learned on fiddle. Uh, Cotton Eye Joe, Fly Around Me, My Pretty Little Miss, Soldier's Joy, Bonaparte's Retreat. A lot of these are uh, traditional fiddle tunes, which they helped popularize. And their biggest hit was a tune called Down Yonder. So people would have heard these on their Victrolas or on yet another great uh, invention, the radio. And uh, what you start having is large re uh, large area broadcasting networks. Uh, we talked about uh, WLS in Chicago. Uh, WSM out of Nashville is the radio station on which the Grand Old Opry uh, is broadcast. And that was also a new thing. The Grand Old Opry was the first national, major national radio show that featured uh, what we'll for now call hillbilly music. Uh, and uh, 
I'm going to take you right on over to the first star of the Grand Old Opry, Mr. Uncle Dave Macon. Uh, find a, a nice quote uh, that someone said, you know, if, if Jimmy Rogers, who we heard last week, and we'll hear more of yet today, is the father of country music, Uncle Dave Macon is the grandfather. And uh, part of the reason is he really, he, he started his career in the end of the 19th century. In the early 20th century, he was, you can see just by that publicity photo that this man had been in vaudeville. He knew what entertaining at a tent show was all about. And like the Gid, Gid Tanner recording, you, there's that same kind of uh, loose and uh, comedic energy. A lot of, a lot of uh, Uncle Dave Macon was especially well known for kind of his comic take uh, and performances. And he, uh, he performed at the Ryman Auditorium, which is the uh, famous auditorium in downtown Nashville, uh, just three weeks before WSM started its weekly Saturday night radio broadcast that was then known as the Grand Old Opry and goes to this day. Uh, so he, he managed to be there for then the first radio broadcast. Uh oh, coming up hot. Way back yonder in Tennessee, the least the convicts out. They worked them in the coal mines against free labor stout. Free labor rebelled against it, to win it took some time. But while the lease was in effect, the made them rise and shine. Oh, buddy, won't you roll down the line? Buddy, won't you roll down? Gonna come, my darling, coming down the line. What do you want to roll down the line? What do you want to roll down the line? Gonna come, my darling, coming down the If you enjoyed that, uh, that fancy banjo playing from Uncle Dave Macon, stick around. We've got more banjo coming up at the end of the, at the, end of the session here. So uh, Uncle Dave Macon went on to form his own band uh, called the Fruit Jar Drinkers. So we've got the skillet liquors, the fruit jar drinkers. Clearly, uh, they knew what worked, what got the put people in the seats. Another uh, style that was, became very popular a little later on is what were known as brother duets. And they often were, in fact, brothers. In this, uh, this case, we have the Delmore brothers, one of the biggest uh, of the brother acts. Uh, also then became Opry, regular Opry members. And uh, there's the Leuven brothers, the Blue Sky Boys, and as we talked about last week, Charlie and Bill Monroe formed a brother duet act early in their career. And they were inspired by groups like the Delmore brothers. Uh, compared to Gid Tanner and the Skillet Lickers, or even, uh, or, and certainly Uncle Dave Macon, you'll notice um, much sweeter, more carefully worked out harmonies. Uh, I think you'll notice the quality of the recordings are better, and that allows you, A, to enjoy those harmonies. Uh, you can hear a guitar much better in, with better recordings. Fiddles cut through like anything. Banjos cut through like anything. That's why those are such good instruments for that early recording technology. As the technology gets better, you can uh, get more subtle sounds. You may be familiar with Bing Crosby. Bing, Bing Crosby's uh, career is basically because he knew how to use a microphone. He, he knew that you didn't have to shout at it. You could get real close and speak very intimately right through the radio speaker to your folks. So, but if you came up in the vaudeville circuit, that, that microphone was just another audience member. You were gonna holler for the rafters. But this is a little more uh, sophisticated and uh, lovely. I think you'll enjoy it. It's Deep River Blues. Let it rain, let it pour, let it rain a whole lot more cause I've got the big river blues. Let it rise, let it fall, let the waves make a wall cause I've got the big river blues. Delmore Brothers. So, as Mike mentioned, uh, you know, it's, it's not that often we get to hear true brother duets. Uh, the style certainly 
has been influential since the days, the earliest days, but to actually have two actual brothers singing in the brother duet style is a special thing. So I do commend uh, that upcoming concert to you if, uh, if this appealed. All right, now we're gonna move on to uh, a group often known as the first family of country music. And uh, a lot of the themes we've been talking about kind of all come together very elegantly in the Carter family story. There they are. We have Maybell on guitar. We have Sarah on the right. I think she has an auto harp in her lap, like you saw in that earlier photo. And that's AP, Sarah's husband, in the middle. They, basically, they were, again, folks who brought music down from the mountains and helped spread it around through uh, recording technology and with the help of uh, industrious uh, businessmen like Ralph Peer to make sure it got on every uh, radio and every uh, record. There's the gentleman we've been uh, referring to, Mr. Ralph Peer. If he doesn't look the, the image of success, I don't know who does. He, uh, he became so successful that, uh, he, well, he founded a publishing company known as Southern Music. It is now known as Peer International Music, and they're a huge publishing, uh, music publishing company. He uh, was so tantalized by what uh, others had been finding that he decided to get down to uh, the southeast and hunt around for himself. And he set up some recording dates in Bristol, Tennessee, in August 1st and 2nd of 1927. Well, he handed out flyers and handbills like you saw earlier, and lots of people came through, including an amb the ambitious A.P. Carter, who gathered up his wife and, uh, and her sister and said, uh, you know, let's get a few of our tunes together. He rehearsed them up, and he drove his wife, who at the time was eight months pregnant, over these bumpy roads, an old car. I mean, it's, it's amazing they got there and back without uh, having to uh, deliver the baby on the way. And uh, Ralph Peer was just knocked out by what he heard. This is uh, one of their very earliest recordings. My heart is sad and I'm in startled for the only one I love. When shall I see him? Oh, no, never shall I meet him in heaven. This is another act he found that same weekend. The test is can you identify this musician? Good morning, Captain. Good morning, Sean. Do you need another mule skinner out on your new mud line? Do you need? Do you need? Anyone got it? Who that was? Raise a hand. Does it sound familiar? Someone recognize that song? It was the yodeling, I'm sorry? Uh, Hank Williams? Not Hank Williams, good guess. He was very inspired by this particular man. We heard him last week, Woody Guthrie, good. Another big fan of this musician. Jimmy Rogers, and that was the Mule Skinner Blues. We heard it last week, and that was the song that Bill Monroe then took for his own audition at the Opry. So that was the same recording session, same two days. I mean, no wonder uh, Ralph Peer was excited. Uh, so you get, both, both these folks went on to become the biggest country music stars of, of their day, and, and highly influential. All right, so let's take a closer look at, at uh, what's happening musically. First we have Sarah. People, everyone, Ralph Peer was the first, but uh, everyone who heard it was knocked out by Sarah's voice. There she is standing again. She has her fingers on the auto harp, but it was her voice that really uh, knocked everyone out. Uh, so soulful and um, there's a pining quality to it that uh, just really, people didn't mind listening to sad music. <laughs> Pop music hadn't uh, become one of, of uh, washing your cares away. I should mention made this uh, 
Ralph Peer's uh, excursion into the into Bristol, Tennessee, which is a far cry from from Atlanta or New York or even Nashville for that matter, was the fact that again technology had developed to the point that he had portable recording equipment that he could set up. People gradually, I mean, it's uh, like looking at a map of, of anything else uh, across uh, uh, American history: the development of roads or railroads or uh, electricity gradually it makes its way deeper and deeper into the the backwoods and the more rural settings always emanating from uh, commercial and urban hubs now they're getting deeper into the woods so to speak Maybell is the guitarist in the group and her guitar style became very influential she uh, actually picks out melody notes on the lower strings of the instrument uh, so it was not just a simple strumming accompaniment, but she, it had a melodic voice. And uh, again, you know, guitars now had gradually become a little more affordable. You could order them through a Montgomery Ward catalog. They'd arrive by train. Uh, the, things became more accessible. And this distinctive uh, guitar style is called the Carter Scratch, where she would strum along and play the melody at the same time. Then you'll also hear some nice harmonies with Maybell and Sarah together. Would you let her part us, darling? Could you truly turn away? Would it make your heart ache, darling, not to see me night or day? I've been dreaming of you, darling, dreaming of your eyes so blue. Take me back, for love I'm dying, for I love none else but you. So again, you can hear how uh, that, the intimacy of that recording is captured. Yes? Is that uh, you, we will get to that, absolutely. Yes, you, you don't miss a beat. Yes, there's the same Carter family. He married a daughter. In fact, he married one of Maybell's daughters. So Maybell Carter was Johnny Cash's mother-in-law, ultimately. <laughs> so, so and that leaves the third member of the uh, Carter family, original Carter family group, AP. Now, um, in terms of his musical ability, he's, he's sort of the least uh, remembered for his musicianship. Uh, however, he literally had the drive to take the family down to Bristol to the Virginia uh, to, the, to the recording sec sessions. Uh, and he was just uh, motivated. He was like the, the band manager. He went and he made them rehearse. He would go out and hunt for songs, develop repertoire. He was the original A&R man, artist and repertoire. Uh, in fact, Ralph Peer basically told him, you know, if you can uh, write some of your own songs, you can get ex you don't just get money for the recording, you also get money for having the composition and the publishing credit. Well, so AP may have written a few songs, but mostly what he did is he started hunting even deeper in the woods. Look, there was gold in them, our hills. So uh, he went around um, with a fellow named Leslie Riddle, sometimes uh, referred to as Elsie Riddle, African-American uh, gentleman, also from the region. They traveled together uh, and collected songs. They were song collectors, mostly for uh, commercial interest. They were not ethnomusicologists. Their, their documentation of where they got the tunes and who they heard it from was not necessarily uh, of a high academic caliber, but we are so grateful to have the music. He would take, bring these songs back, arrange them up with his uh, wife and sister-in-law, and then they would record them. Uh, 350 songs are credited to the Carter family. Now, while he was uh, on the road, uh, he and Sarah, who had already uh, been rather estranged, uh, became the, the tensions of the marriage uh, became even more exacerbated. And she, in fact, falls in love with AP's cousin there in uh, their town, a man named Coy Bays. This is in 1933. Well, the Coy Bays. The Koi Bay's family uh, can't handle the scandal, and they pack him up and head off to the far side of the country, off to California, and uh, sweep him away. Uh, nonetheless, uh, the, the marriage is, is essentially a loveless one, and, and it basically becomes 
a business partnership. And AP is uh, determined, as is Ralph Peer, to keep the Carter family together at least as a musical unit. Uh, okay. In 1938, they strike out for Texas, uh, and in fact, to a border blaster radio station called XERA. This is, uh, it was actually over the border in Mexico, where it was free from all kinds of FCC regulations, and they advertised themselves as broadcasting at a million watts of power. And located in Texas, a sort of central US, it reached, you know, uh, well past Nashville, the, the, it reached all the way to California. I mean, it was uh, about as big a broad, as close as you get to a national radio station uh, from a single source. Now, the whole backstory of XERA is, is amazing. It was, it was developed by this guy named Dr. John R. Brinkley of Kansas. He was a doctor of a of a disreputable sort, uh, but he made millions of dollars, which maybe those two things don't necessarily contradict each other. Uh, he ran for Kansas governor twice and almost made it, but ultimately was, was run out of town in disgrace. Uh, I won't get you into the graphic details of what sort of um, procedures he was offering, but let me just say, and you can look this up for your own interest, that no one ever went broke trying to uh, sell the American mail on a way to increase his... Uh, Performance. <laughs> All right. Anyway, he's the money man behind XER Radio. That's uh, it's just too colorful a story not to include. But it doesn't. It is a, an aside. So uh, this really, in addition to the recordings, now broadcasts the Carter family to everyone. Johnny Cash remembered as a young child hearing the Carter family on the radio. Waylon Jennings in Texas. Everyone has memories of tuning in their dial. Uh, Waylon Jennings, I think, tells a story that his father would keep the truck running, and, or run, ran a cable out to the truck in order to power the radio in, so that they could listen to the music. At this point, it is now a multi-generational affair. Maybell had started bringing up her daughters into the music business. Her three daughters, Helen, Anita, and June. And June, as we mentioned, uh, went on to marry Johnny Cash. All right, the, the Carter family song, Keep on the Sunny Side, which you may know, um, became the XERA radio theme song. And then in 1939, uh, Sarah sang this song on the radio. Would have been better for us both had been never in this wide and wicked world that never been. Oh, I'm thinking tonight of my blue eyes, who is sailing far over the sea. Oh, I'm thinking tonight of my blue eyes, and I wonder if he ever thinks of me. Well, he had dedicated, she had dedicated this song to her long lost love, Coy Bays, out in California, who heard it and hopped in his truck and drove all the way to Texas to find Sarah, and uh, they were then indeed married uh, February 20th in Brackettsville, near Del Rio, Texas. So uh, she had already secured a divorce the previous year from uh, AP, and so they were united, uh, Coy and Sarah, through music and the power of radio. All right. Then uh, they are poised for superstardom at this point. And in fact, Life magazine, probably the biggest magazine of its era, was already to, uh, came out to visit the Carter family in, uh, in Mesa's Springs. And Sarah was flown, not flown back, I suppose, drove, came back by train for this big photo shoot. You know, for appearances sake, everything had to look uh, like all was well in the great Carter family. And it was a big article about the Carter family in Life magazine for the first week, in Fe uh, first week of December, 1941. That story was preempted by the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. And that pretty much, of course, it was, uh, it was a horrible day <laughs> for so many reasons. It also did in the career of the F Carter family as it was originally known. At that point, uh, AP lost steam. Sarah was back in California. 
and uh, the Carter family story comes to an end with World War II. But Mother Maybelle and her daughters carry on, carry on the tradition. And here they are now in the era of television, and we can enjoy one of their performances. You know, the history of the Carter family goes right back to the very grassroots of country music. They're here tonight, Mother Maybelle and Helen and Anita. Maybelle, I've often wondered if you do any of the old original Carter family songs. We sure do, Judd, and we'd like to do one right now. This one is called Keep On the Sunny Side. Here's a Carter family. There's a dark and a troubled side of life. There's a bright and a sunny side, too. Though we meet with the darkness and strife. So when uh, Mother Maybelle and the Carter sisters are uh, brought in to join the Grand Ole Opry regularly in 1950, they bring along a young guitar picker who had yet to make a name for himself, uh, who went on to then become not only one of the greatest guitarists in country music, but probably the most important producer of the mid-20th uh, century by the name of Chet Atkins. He the, ended up formulating what came to be known as the Nashville Sound, which was uh, a more pop-friendly, nationally-friendly sound. So a lot, a lot of the rough edges that we've been exploring and enjoying today, the musical rough edges and quirks, kind of got smoothed off uh, over time and became palatable to, uh, to a nationwide audience, ever less of a niche and ever more of a universal sound. Okay. Periodically, there have been uh, revivals of Carter family music. You can see Lester Flatt and Earl Scruggs, who we met last week, the uh, f founding members of the quintessential uh, bluegrass, uh, Bill, Bill Monroe Bluegrass Boys. They do uh, songs of the famous Carter family. Uh, in the 70s, you have Will the Circle Be Unbroken, a double album anchored by a group called the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band, but with musical guests uh, going back to Ray, Roy Acuff, as well as Mother Maybelle Carter, a relatively young Doc Watson, uh, all kinds of folks, a, a tremendous album. And most recently, uh, the Old Brother Where Art Thou movie and soundtrack did a lot to revive interest in the Carter family. Uh, I'm going to give you just a little smattering of some of these interpretations. <laughs> on your radar, the Carter family is still very uh, popular today. The, one of the biggest uh, internet sensations of the last few years uh, among tweens, tw uh, generally uh, young uh, pre-adolescent girls, was something that came to be known as the cup song. Perhaps your uh, children or grandchildren or nieces uh, 
played this for you and sang it for you and it involves banging on the table and moving the cup around. Well, this came from a movie that I, I did not have the dedication to actually watch the entire thing for you. So I can't tell you too much about it. My sense is it's sort of like the television show Glee, but in movie form. It's about a cappella singers in, uh, in high school, and so it's a wonderful high school drama. And uh, tweens just love the Carter family, as you will now hear. Our heroine now has her audition, and she didn't prepare the proper tune. I got my ticket for the long way round Two bottles of whiskey for the way And I sure would like some sweet company And I'm leaving tomorrow, what do you say? When I'm gone, when I'm gone Did she do a good job? <laughs> <laughs> and where'd she get this great song from? When I'm gone, 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 so there you have it. So uh, the influence of the Carter family and of uh, the, uh, the roots music we've been exploring today persists. I mentioned there's a uh, handsome young Ch Chet Atkins who came up with the Carter family, the young, uh, gorgeous Johnny Cash. And they don't, oh, man, publicity photos like that. I gotta get me one of those. Uh, um, went on to marry June Carter and was very much uh, res uh, in awe of and respectful of the Carter family legacy and was proud, very proud to be a part of it. And um, finally, just uh, to kind of bring this back to more specifically to our discussion of bluegrass, uh, the songs of the Carter family that go on to become, uh, again, kind of canonical in the bluegrass songbook. Uh, there's scores of them, and I'm just going to show you a list of several. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Carter Family into Bill Monroe, same song called Foggy Mountain Top. As you can see what Bill Monroe does with it. If I was on the foggy mountain top, I'd sail the west. I'd feel all around this old wide world to the girl I love me So you can start to hear a little bit of the differences of, of style and technique and character of the uh, early roots music and then the bluegrass sound that uh, Bill Monroe went on to develop. He, Carter family songs that became, as I say, canonical in the bluegrass world include John Hardy, Wildwood Flower, Motherless Children, The Wabash Cannonball, Worried Man Blues, Gold Watch and Chain. You can read this list for yourselves. When the World's on Fire may not be one that's that familiar to you, but it is the melody and chord progression that Woody Guthrie then lifts for This Land is Your Land. Mm -hmm. So uh, I commend that song to you if you care to find it. I'm thinking Tonight of My Blue Eyes was the song that Sarah sang on the radio that brought Coy Bays back. And of course, uh, many others. Uh, I'm gonna wanna wrap up the lecture portion uh, now. Next uh, week, we will uh, turn our attention to sort of what I'm calling the golden age of bluegrass. Uh, but uh, for now, I want to uh, welcome up to the stage is Joan Harrison, who's going to give you a presentation and demonstration of the banjo. So please make her very welcome, Joan Harrison.
afternoon, folks. My name is Joan Harrison. Um, let's say hello to, well, I was gonna say hello to spring when it was sunny out there. It's not quite so dramatic, but um, it still is a lovely day. Um, and this, folks, is a banjo. Now, of course, you might think, um, I'm gonna, first of all, I'll start talking about a very important role of the banjo. Not only does it add drive, um, melody, um, it's the butt of an awful lot of jokes. Um, <laughs> And somebody has to be. Um, oftentimes, on our set, I'm in a, in a local band called Two Blue. Someone will pull out a, um, a joke while someone's tuning, and often it's related to the banjo. Like, why is, how do you tell a stage is even because the drool's coming out of both sides of the banjo player's mouth? Um, <laughs> how is the banjo player able to park in the handicap zone? She put her picks on the dashboard. Um, there's, there's a number of those, but um, I'm going to tell you a real funny, quick story. Um, my bandmate, Be Betsy Rome, she's a guitar player, and you're go actually going to meet her in a couple of weeks. Um, I was over at her house with um, our mandolin player, his name is Michael Sassano, very gifted and fun guy. And we were um, practicing, and Betsy had to take a conference call for her son. And this may seem totally unrelated, and just bear with me, I'm having that kind of a day. But anyhow, um, she had to take a conference call regarding her son's financial um, assistance with school. So while she was doing that, Michael and I are down in the basement and just goofing around playing Green Acres like... And we're going through the whole thing. And poor Betsy can hear this. It's wafting up through the floorboards. And this guy's go, guy on the phone goes, is that a banjo? And I'm thinking after the fact, I may have really helped her secure way more financial assistance than she ever thought she would get. But <laughs> yeah, to, to this day, we were doing it complete with the um, Oliver and Lisa Douglas um, references. But regardless, let's get back to the banjo. And um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about its roots as much as um, I can tell you off the top of my head, I actually did a little research for you folks. I went back and did a little homework um, for the past few days. We all know Earl Scruggs. Anybody out there not know who Earl Scruggs is? Um, you all do, everyone? Awesome. Well, Earl um, was a member of Bill Monroe. You now know, you know who Bill Monroe is. And I, let me see if I can give you the exact dates. You will have to pardon me for um, referencing this, but I don't want to misinform you. This is, this is a class after all. Um, Earl actually joined Blue, the Bluegrass Boys in 1945, um, and he stayed with him, yes, um, in 1948, he and Lester Flatt formed um, what would become Flatt and Scruggs. And um, <clears throat> Earl played, actually Earl owes his style to a man named Snuffy Jenkins. Now you might not know who Snuffy is. He's kind of a, the Uncle Dave Make, Mason. You, you saw um, Macon? Yeah. Macon, pardon me. The young Uncle Dave Macon sort of entertainment genre. But St Snuffy um, started out playing a two-finger style and he eventually turned it into a three-finger style. And he, he credits his playing with um, being influenced by Smith Hammett and Rex Brooks. Now these are names that you can tuck into your little arsenal and pull out when you want to fascinate people. But um, he was born in Harris, North Carolina, the last of 10 children. And he said he began playing the fiddle as a plucked instrument and switched to guitar and later to a homemade banjo he and his brother Verl had built. <laughs> you gotta love this. He bought his first banjo in, two, in 1927 and fell under the influence of those gentlemen. And he was given the nickname Snuffy because he used to wipe his nose with his sleeve during one of the skits. So if I'm here trying to make the banjo into a more cosmopolitan instrument, I, there's just no way it's going to happen. But, but believe me, actually, I'm going to show you that it can. So anyways, Earl never taught Snuff, Snuffy, or Snuffy never taught Earl, he said, but Earl was um, influenced by him. And Earl played, um, played a series of roles. You hear the roles? like a 
flower. And what Earl liked to, what Earl did and what was his mission was to incorporate the melody into those rolls. Like what Earl did, you know, that, that's what he's known for. He's also known for things like, is that very cliche today, you know? He also formed um, backup. Backup's very important in bluegrass music in general. Oftentimes they say the best rhythm guitarists are the ones that you don't even know are there. Now, with it, when I'm backing up an instrument, certainly it's important for me to be able to take breaks, leads or breaks, as we call them in the business. But oftentimes, I'm backing someone else while they're taking their turn. Now, if I'm backing a fiddler, because that's a linear sound, and you had a wonderful demonstration by a terrific fiddler last week. I saw some of that today. I might be doing rolling. I would be doing that behind a linear instrument, such as the fiddle. Now, if I'm backing a mandolinist or um, another guitar, or a guitarist, or even another banjo player, I might be doing what they call vamping. And um, to make it a little spicier. You're switching between, um, actually, chord positions. I don't know if you're from, are you, is any, everybody familiar with chords? Would anyone benefit by a quick def definition of a chord? You, yes. you might? Okay, don't be shy, please. Let's get it all out there. Um, a chord is actually built on certain steps of a scale. It's built, say we've got the C scale. C, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. Those are the notes. No sharps, no flats, no alterations to the, to the initial note. You take every other note. This is, this is basic chord building. When you get into jazz, it gets a little crazier, a little more colorful, as they say. And, um, but what you do is you start with C, skip a note, skip the D, then go to the third, C, E, and G. That's a triad. It's a major triad as opposed to a minor triad. A minor triad has less distance between the notes, which gives it a more somber sound. Um, so that would be, um, we'll do it here, where is it? C. Ah. Sound familiar? It's a chord. So um, what I'm doing here is just bouncing between the chords to get it to get a backup, and that's generally behind the more staccato um, instruments. Um, so that's a little bit about backup. Uh, what was I going to play for you today? Actually, I'm going to be brave. I'm going to. Um, I'm a little lazy as it is, <laughs> as it were, with um, switching tunings. But this is a really nice tune that um, Earl. And does everybody know what this is? I am not contacting the mothership. <laughs> the mothership would have nothing to do with me. Um, it is a tuner. It works off the vibrations, and it is a wonderful thing. So let me see how I can do on this one. mention the tuning of the instrument. This is tuned to an open G chord. And now that we all know what a chord is, um, it's D, G, B, D. Right there is that triad that I was talking about, G, B, D. Those, that's, that would be the one, three, five in G. And then there's a D at the end, 
And this little oddball up here is a G. It's a drone string. Uh -huh. It's the same note as here. So, um, that's the tuning of that, and I'm back to that now. Another very influential banjo player, about the same time as Scruggs, his name is Don Reno. Fascinating guy. Get on YouTube, Google up Don Reno. He's, he's a stitch to watch. Complete with nice white loafers and a smile from here to here. Um, kind of a jazzy guy. I believe he was supposed to be hired by um, Monroe, but he went into the service. And by the time he came out, I think Earl had his slot. But he did eventually play for, um, for Monroe later. But um, he did, he sounded a lot like Earl. He, he employed a lot of the similar roles and patterns. But he also did single string like He did those along the chord pattern. He was also a really good guitar player. So he, he um, translated a lot. And I think um, I actually read a quote today. It, I love going back and reading this stuff because I'm finding um, fun little things. Apparently, he didn't want to sound like Earl because everyone thought he did. So he started doing stuff like that, you know, like more dumb stuff. He did just did a different kind of thing. But I'm going to try and play um, Limehouse Blues. It's a jazzy number. Um, I'll start it off with a single string. He didn't necessarily come up with this single string. Um, it's just note for note off the melody. I did that. but. Um, the part afterwards is based on rolls and chords, so you'll see. showing you abridged versions so that I can um, kind of touch on the different styles. Ordinarily, um, not that there is a try or a hard and fast rule to this to songs um, structure. Generally, it's like an A, A, B, B. You do A twice and then B twice. Often, sometimes there's a C in there and occasionally a D. But um, for the most part, you, you're doing some repetition, which I'm not doing. And let's see, who do I want to touch upon next? Ah, Bill Keith. Bill Keith is a local bluegrass gem, and I believe he will be here. And yes. He was here last year as well. He I was. Mean, two years ago. Wonderful player. And a, I wish that I had actually contacted Bill or had more, um, con more I wish I'd studied with him while, while, I, um, while he's here. He is still here. But he, um, he developed what's called the melodic banjo style. Sometimes it's called chromatic, and when you talk about chromatic, it means notes right next to each other. That's a bit of a misnomer, because they're not always right next to each other. What it is, is it's, it's a note for note playing, whereas Earl played the melody within roles. What Bill would do would actually He'd play them, he's pretty much hitting all the notes. Um, every now and then you might have to change the melody. And they're usually not played on the same string twice or consecutively. It's usually across, so there's a really beautiful ringing, um, ringing quality to it. And let me give you a little bit of history on Bill as well. Try to be quick about this. I know we're short on time. He was born in Boston. And in 1963, he became a member of Bill Bill Monroe's Bluegrass Boys. Bill Monroe is a phenomenal, was a phenomenal band leader. As you will see even today, I see that among a lot of the, the current bluegrass bands. They keep bringing new talent through. And now listen, 
bands come and go. People come and go out of bands. It's, it's the personnel changes often, but he was smart. He was a really smart guy. Now in the 63, he had Bill Keith, he had Peter Rowan, um, who else, Richard Green. These guys were pretty much hippies. You know, they were pretty liberal guys. And there's Bill Monroe incorporating. Now he laid down his rules to a you know, point, I'm, I'm sure. But they kept his music alive. They kept it fresh. They kept it within the boundaries, but changing as music does, as art does. So Bill joined Monroe's Bluegrass Boys. And he played his melodic banjo style. I'm going to do one that he played called the Sailor's Hornpipe. Um, Eric talked about Scottish influences. I'm afraid I walked out when you touched upon that. No, I was tuning up. I was tuning up. I was um, being a responsible performer. Um, but here's Sailor's Hornpipe. We've got a little bit of the, the Celtic feel. across the strings, it, and you could hear all of the notes in that fiddle tune. Um, it would be played differently. You would have to, if, if you were doing a tune like that in the Scruggs style, you would probably be sprinkling, um, probably wouldn't use all the melody notes. And um, if I had truly done my homework, I would have figured that one out for you folks. But um, instead, we'll move on. Um, Tony Trishka. I actually do not have one of his compositions at hand to play. I will play one of his students, actually. Tony Trishka um, was my teacher from Syracuse, New York, and he's kind of known as the father of progressive bluegrass. And he, um, he was in the, he was heavy in the New York scene, um, actually, let's see what, 1971 he was up in Syracuse. Country Cooking, Breakfast Special, these are all names to look up if you'd like to see what happened in the 60s and the 70s. Um, Tony has also had some wonderful success recently. Um, Steve Martin played on a um, wonderful recording of his. And um, actually, did he win the group? He went on to, um, yep, he was nominated. Um, he was given an IBMA award for Banjo Play of the Year in 2007, and um, he was nominated with a Grammy. So imagine that, that this music can get into Grammys. But um, I also forgot, and I'm sorry, I'm going to go back and do a real quick little tune um, as I was going through the masters there. I didn't mention Ralph Stanley. Now, I noticed Eric um, had a picture of Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Anyone see Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Yeah, wonderful film. Um, he was in the Ku Klux Klan. He came out and was that Odeth? Is that what he sang? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, Carter, or Ralph, who was actually a really colorful guy, and I found out today that he ran for some office in his local town. I didn't have time to find out what it was, but by all means, go to Wikipedia and read about Ralph Stanley. He's a very, very, um, very, very interesting guy. He grew up in a little town called McClure at a place called Big Spraddle. <laughs> there you go, just up the holler from where he moved in 1936, and he's lived ever since in Dickinson City. Dickinson County, I should say. Which state? Uh, Southwest Virginia. And this is how he said, I, I love this. He learned to play the banjo claw hammer style from his mother. She had 11 brothers and sisters, and all of them could play the five-string banjo. She played gatherings around the neighborhood, like bean stringings. We all go to bean stringings, don't we? She tuned it up for me and played this tune, Shout Little Lily. I tried to play it like she did, but I think I developed my own style of the banjo. And he did. His is a lot, it's, he, he, he would say it's simpler. It's, um, I'm gonna play um, Clinch Mountain Backstep. Generally, it's played in A. Did you, um, did you folks know what a capo is? You do know what a capo is? Okay, this is a capo. 
And actually, maybe I, again, I'll be brave here and tune in front of you guys, um, take a chance. It's used to alter keys without altering the fingerings and the positions that I have to play. So if I just move it up here, it basically shortens the neck and it puts it in a different key. In this case, A. And if you're wondering what I'm doing over here, perchance, that little, they're actually toy railroad spikes so that I can shorten this string to the same amount that I'm shortening that one up here. There are some fancy, big, cumbersome um, devices you can get, but if, when you get your banjo, and I'm sure you're all going to have a banjo very soon, um, <laughs> you find a very experienced luthier who can, it's, it's tricky business, you can imagine, to nail that in there, but it's a little hook that I slide my string under, and it shortens it, and. Um, so now it'll be in tune with the others. But this is a Ralph Stanley tune. He incorporates a lot of, um, a lot of forward rolls. Uh, it's, 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 this sounds a little bit more modal or mountainy, if we want to say. This is called the Clinch Mountain Backstep. winding down here. Um, let me just make sure I'm just going to play one. I'm actually going to play something pretty for the banjo. There are more banjo players, if you really, if you knew how many were that, that, that are out there, you'd truly be frightened. There are, well first of all, there is an amazing um, arsenal of truly talented musicians, young and old. The young ones that are coming up the ranks blow my mind every other second. So, you know, excuse me, I'm going out to the Mid-Hudson Bridge right now, but no, I think that, um, no, it's not that desperate. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. We've had the, <clears throat> my band and I go up to the Joe Val Blue Fe Bluegrass Festival, which is in the middle of the winter in a hotel up near Boston, and is a truly wonderful time. I can recommend camping with hot showers and maid service um, <laughs> to anyone who'd like to go. But, this year in particular, we were treated to some wonderful young musicians. Um, progressive and traditional. They're hitting all the, they're, 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 they're hitting it all now. It's not, um, but what, who I'm going to talk to you right now, um, his name is Bela Fleck. Anyone here of Bela Fleck? Bela Fleck was a student of Tony's, lived in New York, um, went to the um, School of Performing Arts. I believe he majored in guitar, but. He has taken bluegrass to where no man thought it would go. And he's, um, he's done an amazing job um, taking it out to very broad audiences. Played with the Newgrass Revival, which was a quote unquote newgrass group. Um, played in the 80s. I believe must have had about a 10, 10 year, 10, probably 10 years, at least a decade they played together. As a matter of fact, Bill Monroe once said to Sam Bush, is anyone? Is that a familiar name? A um, phenomenal mandolin player in Newgrass. Bill Monroe said to Sam, so, what do you call that music you play? And Sam said, Newgrass. And Bill said, yeah, I hate that. <laughs> <laughs> now, like, <laughs> now, like I said, uh, Bill Monroe knew how to change it, but you know, we still have our parameters. Um, so regardless, Bela was a huge influence. Actually, that's who I had. I heard that music first, and then I kind of went around the back door, so to speak, and did my homework. And that's the cool thing about music or any kind of art form. You, you're drawn in here, and then all of a sudden, especially today with the internet, you're all over the map, and you can find out what's going on. But this is one that I learned from Bela. It's in the very unlikely key of E flat. It's a pretty little waltz. I heard him play it out. Um, I was out at the Telluride Bluegrass Festival, and I heard him play it with a bass player named Edgar Meyer. Um, phenomenal player. Just the two of them, and this is called For Sasha. Mm -hmm. 
just gusto and twang there's some and actually I'll show, tell you one more thing before I'm, I'm sure you have some questions um, and I'm happy to answer them you'll notice sometimes hands I, I tend to, to go up here a little bit the closer you get to the neck your sound gets mellow as opposed to here When you're playing something like a Bela composition, I would tend to go up closer to the neck. So, who has a question for me? Your instrument is beautiful. Is it special made for you? No, I should say, oh yes, um, <laughs> <laughs> a gift from the queen. No, um, <laughs> this was not. I actually got this banjos sort of by chance. There's a really great store um, out in on Staten Island called Mandolin Brothers. And I was out there taking a guitar for um, repairs. And I had a 1926 Gibson top tension banjo that I was kind of not so happy with. Um, general, actually, it was an arch top. If you ever see a banjo, it's got a little ridge around here. It's an arch top. They are generally really kind of bitey, kind of a sharp tone. This one really couldn't make up its mind. So anyways, I was sort of on the fence about it. Picked this up off the, um, the wall. Played it and loved it. This is a 1991 RB4. RB4 refers to the, the wood type. Um, and RB means resonator banjo. See, folks, it's got, this is the resonator. Now, there's a lot of old-timey music that's being played. There's kind of an influx of an old-timey, which is a different offshoot. You'll see open back. But this is so it's a resonator, RB4 refers to walnut. Um, it's a Gibson master tone. 1991, and at that particular time, there was a, Greg Rich, his name was, was at the helm. And there was about a 10 year period where some really nice instruments came out. And this happened to have been one of them. So, took my 26 out, um, traded it in, took a bath, and kept been thrilled. So, thank you. <laughs> how, how did you get started on the banjo? Oh, I know. Somebody's going to ask me that. You know, um, <laughs> I kind of decided, it, it was sort of an odd decision, um, it's not like I grew up listening to this type of music, I'm not from the holler, although I am from Trucksville, Pennsylvania, which could, sounds like a holler. Um, I was living in New York at the time, in my, I started when I was 23, so I wasn't a kid, and I grew up listening, actually I grew up listening to Casey Kasem, the top 40, Elton John, a huge Elton John, and I loved show tunes. So, um, I also listened to Nitty Gritty Dirt Band, mm -hmm. New Riders of the Purple Sage. Um, who am I thinking of? Um, Amy, what's your, Pure Prairie League. There we go. I, think I, I almost got you. But um, that's what I listened to, and I just decided. At the time, I was waitressing at the Plaza Hotel. I was in New York City, taking art lessons, because I, I was an art major, and I was continuing that. And I decided I wanted to play the banjo. So I found a gentleman down in the village. Um, his name is Jack Baker. He had the, it's either the fretted school of folk instruments or the folk school of fretted instruments. I'm trying to, <laughs> trying to recall it. But I took lessons with Jack for a while. And um, oddly enough, I went to a picking party. These are these strange gatherings we have so that we can all get together and pick. It's, it's actually not quite as frightening as it sounds, but I went to a picking party and I met this young guy who was a um, soap opera actor and he was also taking lessons. He told me that Tony Trishka, now at this point I, I had been 
This is, well, first of all, here's the Earl book, if anybody's interested. This is a, a great little Bible. This was one of the first books. But Tony's also come out with this. This is the Masters of the Five String Banjo. And if any of you are so inclined to read about, and he's probably added a lot of new, um, new players since I got that. But to me, Tony Trishka was a god. He also has a plethora of other um, ins, um, instructional materials. And this guy told me he was playing in his window with the bars on it, of course, in New York City, just playing his banjo. And Tony stuck his head into the window and said, are you taking lessons? And um, when this guy told me this, I'm like, Tony Trishka? Tony Trishka stuck his head in your window? <laughs> and um, so I actually opened the phone book. There he was, called him up. And he called me back while I was waitressing. Um, actually, he called my apartment, and one of my roommates called um, where I was waitressing at the Plaza Hotel. I worked in the Palm Court there. And um, Tony Trishka called you back, and I was on like cloud nine. Of course, there was nobody in that whole place that I could tell why I was in cloud nine. They wouldn't know. But <laughs> so I, it, it was just a decision. Um, I just said I'd like to learn to play the banjo, and um, it's obviously become a really big part of my life. It's a huge part of my social life, which is really cool. It's a really cool thing to have. Anyone else? Yes. I've been teaching box from the Mandel Brothers on Staten Island for 37 years. Really? And my son bought a um, guitar from me. It's listen. So, so I'm very familiar with the Mandel Brothers. It's almost a religious experience to go in there. I mean, literally, because there's just everything's on the wall. All the sounds come back to you. You can pick up and play pretty much whatever you want. So if you want another another form of education, go on out. Are you still there. doing your artwork? Am I still doing my work? I am not, um, not painting. I do photography now. So I've sort of made it a little, little bit of a shift. Um, I wound up with, I, I used to, I loved plein air painting. I was out doing that a lot. But you wind up with a lot of paintings. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much.